When I was asked to speak at this conference, would you like to stand up and talk about um, Ignatian spirituality in a room peopled by Jesuits, including your colleague David Lonsdale, who's written one of the best books ever written on discernment? No pressure there then. <clears throat> So I'm talking about finding God in all things. It's one of those bits of Ignatian speak that gets trotted out all the time. And um, I personally find is more honored in the breach than in the observance. It can easily become a cliche which hides one or, uh, of two challenges. On the one hand, there's the challenge to which Michael Paul Gallagher alludes frequently in his work, namely that religious experience and consciousness in an overt sense is closed to many because they see it as being of an order which they reject for ideological reasons or to which they have no access. So how do we find God in all things? given how very multifarious all things are. On the other hand, there's the challenge that many consciously religious people fail to engage effectively with the material world or the world of ideas and experience, not specifically religious, because they fail to intuit the religious content in so much of what surrounds them. And so they miss the point. We had the experience, but missed the meaning. So finding God in all things is no easy task. It requires the ability to see and understand the significance of the apparently ordinary, or to engage with the extraordinary when it doesn't come clothed in religious garb. And of course, if we look at the whole process of conversion that Ignatius himself went through, what he went through was a pilgrimage where he started off with very set expectations of the kind of thing a pilgrim does. And when he ended up in the cave in Manresa, he experienced many things that were right outside the remit of his religious expectations, but where in the end, he actually found himself to be connecting with his own imagination, with his own affective responses, with his own poverty in a way that took him completely by surprise, but where he learned through these responses the response of imagination, the affective response, and the response of human fragility and sinfulness and poverty to find within it the guiding hand of God. So when we listen as spiritual companions or just listen as ordinary people who are trying to make sense of other people's experience with them and sometimes for them, when we listen to people trying to articulate and make sense of their experience, we often hear them doing exactly what Michael Paul so often advocated, namely undertaking exploration and, if you like, archaeological excavation amid the multiple layers of feelings, intuitions, and insights that we have in order to reach a layer of meaning which can become the context of faith encounters. Now, when such intuitions become faith is a matter for God and the individual soul. And I was very taken, um, about two weeks ago, there was a review in the tablet of a biography of the art historian Kenneth Clark. Now, some of us are old enough to remember Kenneth Clark's groundbreaking television series, Civilization. It was absolutely extraordinary. Less extraordinary now because we're used to the way that the BBC in particular puts together these sort of cultural programs. But it was an absolute revelation in the medium of television when it came through. And Kenneth Clark, it has to be said, uh, was a very naughty man, rather like his son, the politician, um, Alan. He spent rather a lot of time running around the country after other people's wives. And um, he was a, a wicked old roué, really. 
And despite the fact that he was, we find, um, we find a passage in his autobiography which is very revealing. Now, the um, author or the person who was reviewing this new biography uh, noted that Kenneth Clark became a Catholic on his deathbed. And he was very dismissive of this deathbed conversion, saying, oh, well, he just did it in order to please his second wife. <laughs> well, you know, I imagine that the second lady, Clark, probably was pleased that her reprobate husband got in under the wire at the last <laughs> moment. But the reviewer ignores the impact of an experience that Clark speaks of with extraordinary insight. And it's the first quotation on the handout that I've given round. And this is what he says about it. I had a religious experience. It took place in the Church of San Lorenzo, but it did not seem to be connected with the harmonious beauty of the architecture. I can only say that for a few minutes, my whole being was irradiated by a kind of heavenly joy, far more intense than anything I'd known before. This state of mind lasted for several months, and wonderful though it was, it posed an awkward problem in terms of action. My life was far from blameless. I would have to reform. My family would think I was going mad. And perhaps, after all, it was a delusion, for I was in every way unworthy of receiving such a flood of grace. Gradually, the effect wore off, and I made no effort to retain it. I think I was right. I was too deeply embedded in the world to change course. But that I had felt the finger of God, I am quite sure. And although the memory of this experience has faded, it still helps me to understand the joys of the saints. Now what we see Kenneth Clark doing there is precisely the kind of spontaneous discernment that I think Ignatius talks about when he's talking about finding God in all things. This is an experience this is an example, an absolutely classic example, of what Ignatius calls consolation without previous cause. And precisely, the art historian says, I do not think this was an aesthetic experience. I do not think that this was simply a response to the beauty of standing in the church of San Lorenzo, which I knew very well. It came from nowhere. And what we see as he writes about it is his own unfolding ruminations about the moral implications and impact of this experience. How come someone like me, who spends a lot of time being a serial adulterer, gets zapped by God in this extraordinary way? What am I to do with such an experience? Because it's not just a funny feeling or a beautiful experience. It's actually the finger of God touching me, touching me, touching my life as it is. And it implies the demand for a response. And the response is going to have to be personal and it's going to have to be moral. And it's going to have personal and moral implications. It's also going to have social implications. How very inconvenient, how deeply embarrassing. What am I going to do? And he says that he left it behind. But it's fascinating the quotation marks of feeling the finger of God, because that, of course, is a reference to Hopkins's poem, The Wreck of the Deutschland. And it comes from the first stanza, which I'll read because I think even the very first lines of it, whether, I, I don't know whether Clark was conscious of this poem at the time, or it's part of his reflection later on. And this is Hopkins's poem. Thou mastering me, God, giver of breath and bread, world's strand, sway of the sea, lord of living and dead, 
Thou hast bound bones and veins in me, fastened me flesh, and after it almost unmade, what with dread thy doing. And dost thou touch me afresh? Over again I feel thy finger and find thee. Over again, Kenneth Clark felt that finger and was found and found himself, found that mastering me God. And whatever the um, reviewer of his new biography says, I don't think that that deathbed conversion did come simply as a way of pleasing his wife. I think it was deeply embedded in that paragraph, in his memory of that experience of the finger of God finding him. So when we are trying to find God in all things. It is a question of being connected, of being able to make connections. And it seems to me that Kenneth Clark was very well able to make the connections, even if for a variety of reasons somewhat ignoble, he was not able to act on the connections immediately. And making connections with where we are and what we're seeing and what we're experiencing is very much part of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's poem, which, from which I quote also on the sheet, her very famous lines about connecting. Earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes the rest sit round and pluck blackberries. Now, as far as we can see, Elizabeth Barrett Browning thinks that the plucking of blackberries is a very banal task made for the kind of spiritual lumpen proletariat who don't get it when, you know, the, uh, the, the insightful few, the prophetic and religious geniuses are sitting around seeing every common bush afire with God. And when I read that, those lines, I'm very much reminded, of course, of William James and um, his notions of the varieties of religious experience where in his Gifford lectures, he talks about the extraordinary experience of the individual genius in his solitude. Now, in the Foundations of Christian Spirituality course, and there are several of you in this room who've either done it or taught it, um, we connect or we, we compare and contrast that Gifford lecture of William James's when he talks about religious genius and when he talks about religious experience as something extraordinary. We compare that with Nicholas Lash's Easter in Ordinary. Nicholas Lash in no fewer than two chapters in his book which is subtitled Reflections on Human Experience and the Knowledge of God takes a typically Lashian hatchet to William James. First of all, for being an elitist, and secondly, for suggesting that religious experience is um, a task for lone rangers. And Nicholas Lash objects to the fact that James apparently tries to take religious experience away from theology and reasoning about God and also away from the corporate experience of um, religious practice and um, worship within a faith community. And <clears throat> He, Lash, actually makes this accusation against James. The contrast between material and spiritual or external and internal religion, as that contrast was persistently drawn in the dominant narrative of both liberal Protestantism and its secularized successors, expressed deeply rooted anti-Catholic and anti-Semitic prejudice. And he objects to the fact that James, by saying that institutions and ideas form no part of the essence of personal religion, pure and simple, 
argues that they actually distort and threaten such religion. So on the one hand, we've got the religious geniuses who are seeing every bush afire with God. On the other hand, we've got people who sit round and pluck blackberries. But is the sitting round and plucking of blackberries actually an, a, a failure to understand the God who's found in all things? I think not, and that's why I've got Seamus Heaney behind me. Because Seamus Heaney wrote a wonderful book about picking blackberries. I'm gonna have a moment over there to, I thought it was better that we got him to read it rather than me. Um, the actual full text is on the reverse side of your paper, but I would ask you to let Heaney read it himself. Because if a heavy rain and sun for a full week, the blackberries would break. At first, just one, a glossy purple clot, among others, red, green, hard as a nut. You ate that first one, and its flesh was sweet like thickened wine. Summer's blood was in it, leaving stains upon the tongue and lust for picking. Then red ones eked up, and that hunger sent us out with milk cans, pea tins, jam pots, where briars scratched and wet grass bleached our boots. Brown hay fields, corn fields, and potato rails, we trekked and picked until the camps were full, until the tinkling bottom had been covered with green ones, and on top, big dark blobs burned like a plague of eyes. Our hands were peppered with thoroughbreds, our palms sticky as blue beers. <clears throat> we hoarded the fresh berries in the byre, but when the bath was filled, we found a fur, a rat gray fungus, glutting on our couch. The juice was stinking too. Once off the bush, the fruit fermented. The sweet flesh would turn sour. I always felt like crying. It wasn't fair that all the lovely campfuls smelled of rot. Each year, I hoped they'd keep. Knew they would not. who inhabits the physicality of picking blackberries and the whole process of what happens when as a child you pile them up and you have no sense that fruit actually ferments if you keep it unrefrigerated and all of that. And it then brings him into a sense of, and obviously an oft repeated sense of the inexorability of time and the fragility and the passing nature of human experience. Each year I hoped they'd keep, <coughs> knew they would not. So it may be that the geniuses of this world are seeing bushes aflame everywhere. But it seems to me that the plodding blackberry picking, the entry into the ordinary, the deep entry into the everyday, which is what Ignatius and Ignatian spirituality advocates, the being present to the present moment is actually in and of itself a way to become profoundly aware of the Easter that is in ordinary, as Nicholas Lash would say. So that balancing of the extraordinary mountaintop moments, which do sometimes assail us all, but the need to be able to be not only reflective about those moments, but actually to act upon them and inhabit them not only with our minds and with our senses and with our feelings, but actually with our will and our memory and our understanding in the Augustinian sense and the ability to live within the sacrament of the present moment, which of course was also a notion that was coined by another follower of Saint Ignatius. I want, because I know that time is short, to look at two things that follow on, I think, from this. One is my memory of a workshop that Michael Paul gave a good many years ago 
to the Spiritual Exercises Network, of which I was a founding member. And he talked to us about his work in, the, in chaplaincy in the State University in Rome, among young Italians whom I remember uh, he described as the type of Catholic whose watchword was, sono cattolico ma non fanatico. <laughs> A sort of tribal Catholicism that expected to be baptized, have a party at First Communion, have another party at the wedding, and have a final party at the funeral, but don't bother me with anything in between. And his job was to try and move people from that kind of tribal Catholicism into a lived faith. And he said in order to do that, people needed to make three moves and they needed to make the three moves together, at least in synthesis with one another. The first was direct personal experience of God in Jesus Christ. Direct and personal, feeling the finger of God and helping them to be open to receiving and being able to process and understand such experiences. Secondly was a sense of belonging that comes with being part of a faith community. And third was works of justice. And without any one of those three, the completion of faith would not take place. And the completion of faith would not grow. But equally, in order to grow in that sort of a solid faith, one needed to have the capacity to discern what was going on, to make sense of the experiences, and then to act upon them. And in order to do this, sometimes, one needs to learn to reread one's own experience in the light of faith. And the last little section I want to do is to look with you at a couple of pictures from the painted life of Mary Ward. Again, I'm just gonna to have to do a quick run to get them up on screen. Mary Ward, Yorkshire woman, born in 1585 at a time where there were no religious left in England, um, having been suppressed by Henry VIII of unhappy memory. <laughs> and brought up in a household where the faith is in, entirely in the hands of lay people and the occasional passing hidden Jesuit. And it is a Jesuit who gives her a book called The Spiritual Combat. She's 15, she's full of zeal and uh, is desperate to uh, develop her spiritual life. So she goes for it, hammer and tongs, and she tries to translate what she's read in this book into practice. And at the beginning, she finds it uh, very helpful. But she says, after some time of this fervent practice, there occurred such a multitude of manners and ways of producing various acts of virtue, and this with such eagerness, that what at first was easy and pleasing became on a sudden difficult and wearisome, and with the additional scruple that I did not obey good inspirations, not doing all which were presented to my thoughts as good. And here I found myself in some perplexity, not being inclined to confer on these things with others. But God compassionated my simplicity, and in this anxiety gave me courage to reason in this manner with myself. These things are not of obligation, but of devotion. And God is not pleased with certain acts made thus by constraint. To acquire my own quiet, therefore, I will do these things with love and freedom, or leave them alone. There was a 15-year-old unschooled in spirituality, learning to actually discern within her own mind and heart and experience what was good and helpful and what was not. The picture in The Painted Life is of her own notion of how a woman should do good in the world. And the only option, there were only two options to women at these times, aut maritus, aut murus, either a husband or a cloister 
Either way, either the domestic enclosure of marriage and family or the religious monastic enclosure, enclosure nevertheless being the operative word. She tried her vocation as a poor Clare on the advice of a Jesuit who told her that it was the will of God. And again, very briefly, I just want to read her reaction to this. These words, the will of God, so pierced my heart that I had no inclination to say or think of anything else. I stood silent for a while, feeling an extreme repugnance. So as a young woman, untutored in learning to sift her own feelings and affective reactions, she sits on a really strong feeling. She sits on a really strong personal response to something and does what her religious training tells her she ought to do, namely the will of God. Both attempts at being a poor Clare failed. She returned to England, and this is the um, Bavarian painter's notion of what London looked like at the time, complete with onion domes, <laughs> where Mary changes clothes with her maid servant in order to go about in the Catholic underground doing apostolic ministry. And it was that experience of apostolic ministry that eventually overrode what she'd been told about women. She was still attracted to religious life, but her previous choices had been dominated by what she thought she ought to do. And it's the quotation I give you here. I had no inclination to any order in particular, only I was resolved within myself to take the most strict and secluded, thinking and often saying that as women did not know how to do good except to themselves, a penuriousness which I resented enough even then, I would do in earnest what I did. So she has to override theology in a sense. She has to override the theology and the anthropology of women that was prevalent in society and church at the time in order to seek within herself a greater truth. The last picture I want to look at is a picture of what is known in Mary Ward circles as the glory vision. We know that she was living somewhere in the Strand at this time, um, down by St. Clement Dane's church. We don't know exactly where, but she tells us it was in that area of London. And she had been praying. First of all, uh, she was hoping to find some money to endow another woman who wanted to go and try a religious vocation overseas. But she's also in a period of profound discernment as to what she should be doing with her own life, how she was to make sense of these intuitions she was receiving, but which made no sense in the church and in the society of the time. And she tells us, these pictures very often they are, operate like cartoons. There are several things happening at the same time or, or one after the other. So in the little inset, we have Mary praying in the enclosure of her bedroom. So here is the formal experience of prayer, the godly bit, where she tells us that her meditation was cold and not to my satisfaction. I find it immeasurably comforting that the foundress of my congregation was also rubbish at prayer. There we are. And it's when, after this, she's back doing the very banal activity of brushing her hair and getting dressed that she says, something very spiritual befell me. I remained for a good space without feeling or hearing anything but the sound, glory, glory, glory. The sound, glory, glory is a sort of Ignatian cue, of course, from the Ignatian motto, ad maiorem dei gloriam. But it also it reminds me, certainly, of the second century uh, theologian St. Irenaeus of Lyon, who says the glory of God is a human being fully alive. In the painting, Mary Ward is looking in a mirror. Who and what is she seeing? She's seeing the image of a woman, a woman who is the glory of God.
fully alive. And the rest of her life is an unfolding of understanding how that might be, despite all the strictures that the church and society were placing on the role and activity of women. So here also, in a sense, she's blackberry picking, or she's trying to make sense of how the burning bush experience of contemplative prayer escapes her. But in the very banality of the ordinary, that is where the insight comes. These are just some rather random thoughts and uh, mappings out for you of what I think Ignatius means when he talks about finding God in all things. He certainly doesn't mean, I think, ignore the mountaintop moments and ignore the moments of extraordinary revelation or insight that can and do often happen to us. But test them also against the choices that you make through your own will, test them through your own feelings, test them through your imagination, test them against the tradition, but also test them against what you know to be true. And realize also that God does not only speak to us in the burning bush, but if we are able to enter sufficiently deeply into the sacrament of the present moment, into the response, the affective, but also the sensate response to the ordinary. And if we are able to do what Thomas More tells his son-in-law in Robert Bolt's play, A Man for All Seasons, that he is doing, serving God wittily in the tangle of his mind. In all those things, in the intellect, and the intellectual hammering out of religious truth that William James rejects, in the corporate experience of the community of faith which William James also rejects, in the Easter in ordinary, in the incarnation of God's presence in ordinary everyday matter, we find God in all things. Thank you. Thank you.